I'm afraid this is our final session um, of this uh, weekend long program. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, we have combined, and I know uh, some of you are involved in politics and uh, issues to do with power and so on, and this is one of the aspects that uh, so I can deal with in the book. Uh, the other, there are many other areas we could have covered, but uh, Stad has chosen those particular areas. Uh, but I think if you, this is really a starting point uh, of the, the various discussions that we want to have of those. Uh, so please appreciate that within the period that we have, we have to just choose uh, some of the key areas. Uh, so what we're going to do is using the same format, really. Uh, the staff is going to introduce the three areas, which is ecology, uh, ecology and education, and then we'll go into our groups. Uh, this time around, what we will do is ask uh, perhaps a couple of groups to focus on uh, ecology, two groups to focus on economy, and another two groups to focus on education, and then we'll take feedback for, uh, from that. Uh, so, over to Stavro. Bismillah. Bismillah ar rahim Okay. So, uh, there will be three uh, topics now. And I, I want you to, you have to decide which one you want to take. We'll see this with Hussein afterward. But uh, just uh, uh, let us uh, really... Uh, focus on, on the whole philosophy that we have been working on since yesterday. We are talking about Islamic ethics and we are talking about the objectives, what we want to achieve, what are the main objectives. So if you come to, once again, you can have this in, uh, in, uh, uh, in front of you when it comes to uh, the, the uh, the objective, one of the main three objectives is nature. And this is why we, uh, we need to speak about environment, we need to speak about our role, we need to speak about the way we are dealing with it. You know from the, the, the Quran, but, but also from the Sira, the prophetic traditions, that it's critical, it's central. Uh, this uh, 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 caring about nature, about uh, uh, animals and, and uh, about uh, uh, meat as well, and even about halal. The questions that I, I would put in ecology and environment is really uh, to start with a simple discussion about uh, uh, something which is uh, what are the objectives that we have to uh, respect or to try to reach in the field of uh, environment. So uh, uh, the objectives are important. It's just to try to set them and to try to get a sense of uh, what do we mean by that. The second uh, thing which is also uh, important uh, is what are the priorities. And here it's important. We don't have time. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be it will it wouldn't be possible to it will not be possible to speak about, for example, one of uh, the topics that I'm I'm addressing in uh, uh, in the book. It's, for example, about halal meat, and you know, and halal food. For example, in one of the fields that I was talking about, the seven fields, uh, to be very practical, one of them will be halal meat and halal food. What is halal in the food that we are talking about? What are the uh, conditions and the criteria? How do we define this? Because it's, uh, it's now we, ha we are dealing with technicalities much more than with meanings. And when uh, 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 I was asking some of the questions, uh, I was facing a controversy on internet, Tariq Ramadan saying that, uh, 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 you know, uh, bio, uh, uh, how do you call this? It's uh, uh, all the bioproducts and, and, and meat and, and the way they are treated in some, uh, 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 by some people might be more halal than the way we kill the animals and we slaughter the animals. And I'm asking the question in the book, what makes halal meat halal? Is it the way we slaughter the animals or the way we uh, nurture them and we respect them alive and not only the way the, we kill them. 
So we are de now dealing with technicalities, but the way the animals are treated is just un-Islamic by definition. But we're not tackling this. So, so the point here is, uh, what are the objectives and what are the priorities? And do we have, and this is the third question, do we have something to say or to contribute with as Muslims? So what are the objectives? What are the priorities? What could be our contribution? Which is exactly the whole philosophy of what we have been talking about since yesterday. Okay, objectives, its priority, and contribution. In uh, economy, one first, sim apparently a simple question, but in fact quite difficult. For those of you who are interested in economy, do you speak about Islamic economy or Islamic ethics in economy? And what could be the difference? Is there something special in Islamic economy that you can call it Islamic economy? Or are we dealing with Islamic ethics in economy? Just respond to this question first. Okay, where do you stand on this discussion? The, the, the second uh, 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 question is, what do we want exactly? Do we want to do as good as the current economic order, or do we want an alternative? And to this, you have to respond quite clearly. What do you want when you speak about ethics and economy? Because what we have now, it's, are you going towards a, an adaptational reform or a transformational reform? Which today, everything which is coming from what we call Islamic finance and Islamic economy is adaptation. It's to create niches of halal transactions, Sharia compliant transactions, and we have windows uh, in the global order. But all this is to adapt ourselves to the current order. So what do we want to achieve? If you were to come with, okay, what are our objectives in the economic field, what would you say? which is not to sit down and to dream of an other world. I ask you to be realistic. What are the realistic objectives in economy that we may have? You get the point? Because if you want to, 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 to be efficient, it's not only to dream the objectives, it's, it's to get realistic objectives. And uh, having said that, give me two or three questions that you want to put to the scholars of the text related to economy, to the current order? What are your questions? Now, uh, the last field, and once again, you know, for me, all this, and for you, you, you need to value your questions. You get the point. Huh? All the discussion today is not only to come with answers. And the book is not, it's full of questions. You read the book and say, wow, it's, it's much more complex than what I thought. It's full of questions. but. You have to value at the end of today, this seminar, not only the, the, the frame that was put to you that you can accept or not, but the point is within the frame is all the questions and the seriousness of these questions for you and for the future. Value your questions and not only what is coming from a scholar giving you answers. And, and this is the problem that we have. We, we want very good answers, but we don't value uh, sophisticated questions. And it might be that today we are not going to leave from here with answers, but these questions are helping us to move ahead and to try to, fo to move on and to try to find other uh, um, answers and, and, and more efficient answers. The last field uh, is education. And uh, we are always repeating from an Islamic viewpoint, it's all about education. Aqra is education, it starts with this, there is no uh, way of being a Muslim without education, and we all agree on that. And what we have now, we are qualifying education. The same way as we have state and Islamic state, we have education and Islamic education. So my question, the first one, a simple one to put, a difficult one to answer and to respond and to address, is, once again, what for you is Islamic in education? Is there something which is specifically Islamic? And if yes, what? Uh, now, you remember yesterday we said 
everything when it comes to practicality should be contextualized. So in our context, and think about your context in the UK now here, or in Europe, because some of you are coming from different countries, uh, what would be the priorities for you in the field of education today? And you need to decide uh, uh, which kind of uh, target audience you are talking about. If it's you know, teenagers or adults, you decide this, but you decide which, what is the most important age. You know, some psychologists are telling you everything happened before six. Others are saying we don't need school or Islamic schools for the young because it's okay, we can manage. We need Islamic schools for the teenagers because this is where we can't control. Uh, this is what we say, control or monitor and know what is happening and it's difficult. So the context and the age, you decide the age, but the context is your context. What are the priorities that you have? And once again, while we are always talking about education and we think it's essential, can we contribute? Are you something to give? Have you something to give as for related to education to the the society you live in. What is your contribution? Because there was one question that I was asking and I will end with this. Don't we have the great majority of our Islamic schools are mainly schools for Muslims rather than being Islamic schools with principles? So look at the last 30 years of Islamic education or Islamic schools. What did they give or have they given to the society as a clear contribution to renew of you know, anything which has to do with uh, educational theory, for example? If you are contributing, if you even, you know, you go to Montessori, you can agree or not, but at least you know that they have contributed to say, let us think about a new way to deal with our students. They did that. Have you seen someone saying, I took this from a, an Islamic experience and it's a contribution to the society? Are we doing this? Is there something that is new or is it only protective Islamic schools for Muslims, which started at the beginning only for women and girls, as if we have to to protect them more than men and boys. So these are the three questions, okay? Topic, the first field about ecology and environment. What you were saying mainly is that there is a lack of awareness and not getting the, the sense or, or the understanding that this is one of our priorities. And not only this is true for, within the community, it's true also for the Muslim scholars. Very often we talk about, you know, respecting nature, but uh, the behavior that is connected to this big word and concept of respecting nature is not translated into what is expected when it comes to many of the things that you are saying. Uh, so the lack of understanding means that there should be uh, uh, not only an interest, but something which has to do with education. And if you look at many of our scholars, they can speak about environment in very general terms, but not really knowing what are the challenges and in which way Islam is responding to one of the challenges. So we need a specialization also for scholars in that field, which is not the case. We have few people who are, uh, there is one sister who, is, uh, who has converted to Islam in Sweden, uh, who have been very much involved in sustainability and development. We have Mao El Azuddin here in the, uh, uh, in, uh, in the UK, uh, and some of other uh, people. Uh, there is, I, I forgot his name, he is based in, uh, SubhanAllah, I forgot his name. He, he uh, wrote a book on contemplation. Malik Badri. Malik Badri, that's it, Dr. Malik Badri who in fact is the starting point of, uh, of anything which has to do with environment, is contemplating nature and understanding the beauty, and this is where it starts. So uh, the, uh, there is one thing that you are saying that we need also to focus, it was said by the second group, but uh, when it comes to uh, education, 
for us, environment and respecting nature is one dimension of our spirituality. It's one dimension, the way we look at, at nature and the way we respect. So it's a prayer, that's, you said it, but the way it has to be uh, put in our priorities is really uh, critical. It's critical. It's, it's a spiritual dimension of our religion, is, is in which way we, we are not saying we only pray five times a day. Uh, our relationship to nature, our uh, uh, spirituality is to rem remember Allah's signs in nature. And this is why we are respecting. It's an act of love. So, so this is something which is a, a, a deeper contribution. When, as Muslims, we don't only come to the rules, but we understand the meanings. And this is also the way we eat, and especially, I have been repeating this, but I think it's so, it's so revealing, the fact that during Ramadan, in fact, we are not eating less. <laughs> we are just eating more at different times, which is the reality. And all the, you know, all the supermarkets, they all know this, and they are now opening, you know, places where you have halal food during Ramadan because they are making money. The whole philosophy here about the environment, we are not going, if we enter this, because now environment is also a fashion. You can see, you know, transnational corporations coming with this and they are, yes, we are respecting nature, this is, you know, uh, natural products. They are making money with our attraction. To, and this is not the way, it's not, we should not come with environment through something which is a new market to make money, but a new spiritual take to come with what you are saying is responsibility. And it means to, uh, uh, we need to come also to things that are not touched so far. But uh, are we going to say that if there is no alcohol and there is no pork, everything is halal, whatever is the product, whatever is the origin, if for example you have children that are treated like slaves and they are producing products that you are eating and you are using, is it halal? Is halal only the technicalities? Right, for example, once again I'm, I'm repeating this because, uh, uh, for example, I, I don't drink anything which has to do with Coca-Cola, for example. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but this is a position which is, you are what you eat and what you drink, and you need to take an ethical stand. But this is at a personal level. But do we have a discourse and understanding coming from our scholars for them to understand what is happening? For example, when you go to, you know, you don't, uh, you get fast foods and all this. All this has to do with the environment. It's the spiritual dimension which is so important, the way you educate your kids. Uh, when you know that, okay, recycling is good, and then you take your kids and you go to McDonald's, where this transnational corporation is just destroying nature. They are destroying nature. Just for you to get this meat, halal meat, not here, but uh, in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Which, by the way, is exactly the same as here, but it's halal in Mecca and not so much halal in London. But you don't know that. Because the, you know, the geography is telling you if it's in Saudi Arabia, it should be halal. But in fact, it's the same as here. Okay, the point is that we need to take a very serious stand here in, in what we are eating and the environment. It's a whole philosophy of life based on our spiritual take. It's not only technicalities. And you are putting this lack of understanding, environment, responsibility, uh, as you were saying, as citizens, but also our contribution. Are we, do we have an added value here, which could be important? If we really can connect a responsible attitude towards environment and in, towards consumerism, this is where Muslims could be very effective. And they are going to be also for themselves uh, 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 understanding so, where they can contribute to the current discussions. On, and this is why we can come to the second field, which has to do with education here. And uh, once again, uh, we have some of, uh, it's not clear what is an Islamic education. And what you were saying here is, is it teaching the principles to be faithful to the principles? Uh, and then 
uh, and not only to protect ourselves from the surrounding uh, uh, environment. And one of the definition is positive is to educate men and women to be positive contributors out of their faithfulness to the objective, which is connecting education and ethics here, yeah. which is you are faithful and you are contributing. Your faithfulness is visible out of your contribution. Uh, and education should be about that. So uh, you can call it Islamic education or you can call it education with uh, Islamic ethics and Islamic ethics and education. At uh, one point, you have to take a decision, even in the, 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 the state system today, where very often, you know, when I have people telling me, oh, our schools are working quite well because we are competing with the best schools in the country. And we are competing as for the marks and what level we have. But are we competing as an ethical contribution to the society through education? which is the very meaning of Tarbiya. And, and this is why, for example, after 20 years when uh, uh, Yusuf Islam was working and, and you know, he was involved in uh, uh, Islamic education, he was saying, our main problem as con you know, people who are in charge of Islamic schools are not the, the, the students, they are the parents. Because there is a lack of responsibility and you can't think that you are going to educate your kids because you send them to an Islamic school. It's the relationship between parents, the authority of the parents and the authority of the teachers and the schools, which is so critical here. So there's communication and you can get very, very good results even in a state school system if you, are, if you have parents that are aware, involved, present, uh, uh, talking. It's uh, contributions and collaboration of authorities, the authorities of the parents and the authorities of the schools and teachers, which is critical. That sometimes we are cutting because we think that the Islamic school is going to, do, to make it all and, and to provide it, to provide it for, for, uh, 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 to the community and to the... So these are important things, but do you think that the scholars today, the ulama and nusus, they, 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 they can get these priorities because education is something which has to do with the environment. We always have to think about education in a specific environment, schools in a specific environment. This connection between schools and environment is important. Cultural environment, uh, language, uh, behavior, uh, all entertainment, it has to do with this. So the scholars in a specific country should come with a better understanding of what the challenges in the specific country. But so far, we still are very, very superficial in our understanding. And, and we need to come with this, uh, some of these questions uh, that you can't just say teaching principles, that's fine. Okay, but teaching principles where? What does, it mean, what does it mean, for example, in the, in the UK? Those who believe and do good deeds. Okay, tell me what it means to, good, to, to do good deeds. Knowing that educating is to give value to someone. If you are educating me, you are, you are giving me a value. And the value is the way the people are perceiving me, my father and my mother and my society. So how do we connect this? In Muslim majority countries, when you come with an Islamic education, it's quite natural. You are going to get the value because you know about your religion and this is uh, uh, celebrated in your community, not here. So you need to find other way to give value to your students in the West. So it has to be adapted. The priorities of education should be adapted. And this is why we need to have this collaboration between teachers, head teachers, and scholars in the priorities and what should be done. And the substance, what are you teaching? Well-being, if, if, and this is why here you put some of the objectives, what do we want to, to achieve from, uh, through education? Well-being, contribution, responsibility, critical thinking that you said, all this is, is we need to get these objectives clearly put in order to, to come with an educational strategy. Uh, and, and when I am uh, listening to what you are saying is that uh, uh, to be careful that sometimes we think that we have an alternative system, but we are cutting ourselves from reforming the main system. If we are serious about being truly British, 
we shouldn't avoid being involved in the state system and to try to be uh, effective there. We, need, we have our, the great majority of our children are in the state system. This is one. The second, we need teachers. We need you know, psychologists being involved in the schools. We need parents to be involved. So it's really a whole philosophy once again. And this has to be done uh, at the local and the national level. And to stop dealing with education the way we are dealing, it's, as you said, out of fear. This system is a corrupt system. It's going to corrupt my, my kids. I'm, I want to pr protect them. I can understand this attitude because very often if as parents you are not involved, you are going to lose your children in the system. But you can do exactly the same with an Islamic school because you have exactly sometimes, you know, schizophrenic attitudes that are uh, there. So we need to tackle this education. It's important at all these levels. We need to get the priorities. What do we, we want to do? And for example, higher education, it's also important. What is our contribution as citizens in higher education from the, the, the viewpoint of Islamic ethics? What are, we, what are we contributing? What are we giving? to the, 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 While you see what was done by our predecessors in, in you know, the great Andalusia, today what is our contribution in that field? While if you look at, at the, the figures, it's really amazing how many students do we have in universities. But for example, in education, when we organize something, the Islamic organization, the, all these Islamic organizations, very often it's aware, Islamic Awareness Week, it's debates around Islam, it's about us. We talk about us and we want to present to people we are nice, we ask. But this society needs many other topics to be tackled by, by us as citizens like environment, like education, like the system itself. Uh, we are not there and, and we are not involved. And through this experience, we can come back to the scholars and deal with them and, and also to set the priorities and what are our objectives. And, and just to, to, to end with economy, um, it's quite interesting. I will start with the second group and to come to the first one is what is interesting here is uh, uh, the fact that uh, when I was asking about Islamic uh, uh, economy or eth Islamic ethics in economy, I was asking just, can we talk about Islamic economy? Is there something which could be, uh, and the answer that we got is, if we change the whole system, we are able to speak about Islamic economy, but as, uh, uh, as it is now, we can just speak about Islamic ethics in economy. The, the, at the end of the day, the real question is, are we going to adapt the system or are we going to try to change the system, to transform the system? And it's a question because the Muslim economists today are not clear on that. With all what we have, I don't know if you were following all the discussion with the crisis, so many people saying we have the alternative, we are not facing the same, you know, uh, 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 bankrupt, it's, it's, it's different, we are protected. That's fine, it's true that in some situations, there was a protection, we all, not only for the Muslims, by the way, but all the people who had uh, a protective uh, 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 way of uh, uh, dealing with the current economy. It's not only because they were implementing uh, Islamic uh, 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 technicalities and techniques, but at the end of the day, uh, the perception is we have an alternative, but all the, as it was said, the, 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 the people who are working in economy are saying, we are changing names, but we, we keep the same uh, uh, procedures, which is not exactly true, because they are things that are specific, but it's still within the system. And this is where we are not ambitious in that field. And very often in, in Muslim majority countries, for example, in the petro monarchies, they don't care about anything which has to do with economy. The Islamic dimension of Sharia is in punishment and traditional settings, but not in dealing with the economy. No alternative in economy. So you said that, and I think that this is where we need to come with first uh, 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 knowing how we name what we want to do and what are our, our objectives. And it's easy here to say uh, we want an alternative. Now it's quite clear that in isolation, the Muslim economists are not going to get anything. While we have from within the system 
with Christians, with even atheists, people who are criticizing the system and they are trying to find something which is an alternative. We have many of the tools and we have some of the visions that are necessary for that. But in isolation and uh, uh, the way we are doing it now, and sometimes the way it's uh, organized in Islamic banking is problematic. And this is exactly where in the book I'm saying, if you want to understand what is adaptive reform, just go for economy and you will see. What we are doing is adapt, to adapt ourselves to the current system. And there is, no, uh, um, uh, there is no alternative which is proposed. For example, the book Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, when I was in Malaysia, I, I was told before going there, you know, it's great. It's really the, the, the great model of Islamic economy. Uh, what I saw is mainly American Islamic economy. Uh, and then I, I haven't seen anything which is an alternative. It's just, I, I saw some people in uh, computer uh, uh, sciences working and having small enterprises doing things that are very interesting independent and when they you know remember the economic crisis during the 90s in uh, in uh, the region in asia they were protected because they were completely uh, isolating themselves from the current system and they had an alternative without interest way of uh, 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 working which was quite interesting and still interesting because i know that they are still working they are trying and you have some small and middle enterprises that are doing this and and you have entrepreneurs that are trying to come with creative at the local level and we can and we should support that having in mind that uh, this has to be a, a bigger project for the future but uh, what is proposed now in Malaysia as an alternative model, if you just study it, is, is not this. It's just we, and this is why we have to come with the clear objective. Do we want to do the same or do, do we want to do something else differently uh, as to distributing wealth, as to justice, as to ethics in economy or an economy at the service of human beings, which is not clear as to our discussion. The book, Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, I got a call from your Oxford University Press telling me your book has been banned from there. Because I'm criticizing the system. I was criticizing and still is criticizing the system. But this is exactly where uh, it's important to know where we are heading. And there is a lack of, yes, there is a lack of uh, uh, creativity in, in, in this. As you were saying, another system should be our main objective. But today, uh, this is not what we are, are doing. And we keep on speaking about, uh, talking about Islamic economy and Islamic finance, while it's quite clear that uh, uh, we are not doing the job. And this is uh, the best example of this legal attitude obsessed with the rules and forgetting the meanings, forgetting the objectives. This is where our ethics is lost in technicalities. We are so focused in technicalities that we are forgetting and missing uh, the point. So these are the three fields. Um, just want to tell you, for me today, why this is important, what we have been doing. First for you is to think about the questions that you may have and to see where are the limits of our thinking and to understand that there are many other fields. We just chose some of the fields uh, but all these fields are, once again, coming back to us, the critical thinking, asking the, 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 the right questions, prioritizing what we need to do. And then this is where the, the work with the ulama and nusus should start, is this is what we need now. And these are the critical questions that we have. Uh, I, I hope that out of this, uh, uh, with this uh, seminar, at least, you are more confused as for the simplicity and the complexity of the question. Because some people are saying, oh, you know, it's, we know what we, no, we don't. We have a, a very deep problem in setting uh, uh, the whole framework and getting the right questions. So, so I want you to, to, to just to think about that, to uh, also think about in which field you can be effective because we need every one of us here is needed somewhere.